Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I am Lieutenant Colonel Nina Hill from the Office of the Chief of Public Affairs. Uh, today's press conference will focus on the United States Corps of Engineers and their relief efforts in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Today we'll, we have Lieutenant General Todd T. Seminite. He is the U.S. Army Chief of Engineers and the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. General Seminite will give a brief opening statement and then we'll open up the floor for questions. I'd ask that you please state your name and your affiliate um, and then also limit yourself to one question and one follow-up um, until we've gotten around the room and then we'll continue to field questions afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Todd Seminite. Well, thanks, Nita, for that introduction. And as uh, Nina said, I am, uh, I am the Chief of Engineers in the Army, and I'm the Commanding General of the Corps of Engineers. I think it's important to point out that I really work under three different authorities, and we talk about these disasters here. Uh, I'm really based, our, our guys are working in all three of them. So we do an awful lot of work for the Department of Defense, okay, as the Corps of Engineers. We also have our specific authorities in the Civil Works mission, which is rivers and harbors and, and a lot of other missions there, and we'll talk about that on one of the dams we're working. And then we also have very, very specific mission for FEMA. As you know, there are several emergency support functions for FEMA. Uh, we provide that function, which is the engineering function, uh, emergency support function number three. I really can talk about uh, any one of the last four storms. Uh, we've been going uh, all out for the last six weeks, probably about 2,000 people throughout the Corps of Engineers with a lot of functions throughout Texas with Harvey, uh, of course with Irma in Florida, Irma when it hit the Virgin Islands, and then when Maria came through, it really hit both the Virgin Islands and it hit Puerto Rico. Uh, the other one was Nate that came through and uh, came up through Mississippi, and we did not have a lot of involvement about it. But when you think about the ability of the Department of Defense and FEMA to be able to handle four major storms in six weeks, I think that's something that is a, a real compliment to both of the agencies because you're able to not only take care of the storm you're working right now, but be able to look forward at that next storm and to be able to predict and have the right teams to be able to react. If there was two messages I would want to tell you that would um, clearly uh, be the, something that I learned in all these, I've been on the ground several times in all these different operations, I think it's the word passion and urgency. And I'll tell you that first of all from the people that I see on the ground. I mean, I went into the backside of, uh, of Harvey when we saw um, people down there flooded out uh, in uh, Buffalo Bio, and I looked in their eyes and I saw the challenge of how could they get their lives back together. And they definitely had a passion to try to continue to get back to a way of normal, but they also wanted an urgency from the federal government. I think uh, probably what hit me the most, uh, last week I was in Puerto Rico. We're going to do, we're doing blue roofs. I'll talk about that in a minute. And I went down to a house. We had to work down, our way down through the debris to get down into Maurice's house. Maurice was an E6 in the Army, and uh, he since got out. And he was in there trying to cook breakfast in his house, but he had no roof. And so we had a contractor crew that came up and put plywood on top of that and a blue roof to cover over um, his area. And when Maurice came out and talked to my guys and the contracts that were working there, again, same thing. He had a passion to continue to try to be uh, get back to normal, but he also had an urgency. And this is something that, as I look at the people that have been affected there, um, it's where we're all in. Whatever we can do, we're continuing to go as fast as we possibly can. The other end of that dimension, though, which is just as important, is the passion and the urgency I see here in Washington, D.C., to continue to be able to try to, uh, to get these people back to normal. I was in the White House two hours ago, and I saw that from the members of the cabinet who are fully committed to be able to continue to commit the resources needed to be able to do, do what we needed to do. Several times I've been in the D Department of Defense, uh, OSD, the Secretary of the Deputies, uh, continuing to be able to push us along with uh, NORTHCOM, uh, the Defense Logistics Agency, to be able to step up where need be to be able to ask, what else can we possibly do to go forward? And then on several of these storms, General Milley, the Chief of Staff of the Army, 5 o'clock um, for many, many nights in a row had the entire Army staff in there to try to figure out how can we as the Army continue to step up to do what we need to do to be able to help these people out there. And I'll talk a little bit about more of the support that we've gotten from DLA and the, and the JFLIC team, Lieutenant, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant General Jeff Buchanan and his team down on the ground. So uh, when we come into these disasters, we normally do five major functions. And we've got an infographic on the side here, and I can certainly answer questions about any of them. I'm going to end with the electricity because that's probably what's most important. We basically have 
have done these five functions in all four of the big areas. But uh, the ones that I, I just kind of want to highlight them, first of all, ports. We do have authorities under our Civil Works Authority. Almost every one of these uh, disasters took out several of the ports, uh, sometimes 14 or 15 ports. You've got to be able to get logistics into these areas to get supplies back in. So whether it was Texas, Florida, uh, Virgin Islands, or pre Puerto Rico, how do we come in the day after the storm, survey those storms, and uh, survey those ports, and be able to get dredges and barges in there to be able to continue to get materials in and out? Working hand by hand with a Coast Guard who's instrumental and doing that, but a significant port mission that we can certainly talk about during questions if you want. Next big issue is, mission is debris. So an awful lot of trees that are down. Uh, Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands is where we probably saw the biggest deal of debris. So we come in with big contractors that we already have on contract ahead of time, and then we go back out and we immediately start picking up debris on the sides of the roads and putting them in large trucks. We take it to a special area, and we're able to be able to get it out of the road so people have mobility. It's not just the vegetation debris. It's also debris that's in people's houses. So we actually sort it. We have places for refrigerators. We have places for old mattresses, hazardous waste. Our contractors, we basically, we tell everybody to put it out on the side of the road. The contractor comes by, he picks up that debris, and we get it out of the lane again so people can get back to normal. Uh, I think another big mission, which is uh, really picking up traction in Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, is what we call the Blue Roof Mission. If you have a house, and it actually has to have 50% of the house that is still uh, um, in a feasible manner there, then we come back in and we will put a blue tarp over the roof. And we have learned that if we can put the tarp on in a couple weeks or a month, then we're able to really get the, continue to be able to protect that house. What we found in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands is that a lot of times there was a lot of structural damage to that particular house. So we had to come in and almost rebuild part of the roof structure to be able to get the tarp back up and over. And you can see on the numbers here on some of the things that we've done. I think in Florida, I don't have Florida on this particular infographic, but seven thousand blue roofs in Florida. So the contractor will go right on down the street, take out the blue tarps. And this is just not a regular tarp. This is an engineer that comes in and actually stretches that over, be able to nail it back up under your gutters and continue to be able to do what we need to do to be able to make things happen. Um, the, the, the last big mission I really want to talk about is that there are areas where we have dams and reservoirs and infrastructure in here. So we go back in and we assess that infrastructure. We have programs that if a police station gets wiped out, we can build a temporary building. We can go back in and help get a school up and running. Uh, and we also have challenges with uh, the civil works infrastructure. The dam that is down in Puerto Rico is one that you're probably tracking. This is a uh, one of the Puerto Rican government dams that basically had an awful lot of water went into it. The water went over the top of the dam, the spillway, and then that spillway basically failed. This is very similar to the dam in Orville. And what happened is so much water coming down that spillway that had not come down in many, many years that the spillway started to break up and crumble. And about the bottom 50% of that spillway basically washed away. The water continued to come over for about 20 days. The challenge is we had a lot, a lot of rain and there was no other way to get that water back out. So we did two big things. First of all, came in with a lot of Jersey barriers. These are things like you would protect the, uh, if you're trying to you know, fence off something. Uh, we put in over uh, 500 Jersey barriers into that area. And then what we call these super big sandbags, ones that we deliver from helicopters. This is where the Department of Defense and the National Guard Bureau was invaluable, whether it was the Marines dropping them in, the National Guard, uh, helicopters uh, day after day putting in an awful lot of sandbags. And you can see on the numbers there, but just a, a massive amount of capability. If we didn't continue to put that level of material in, then the water coming down the spillway would have actually eroded the dam and we had risk of the dam failing and a lot of people living downstream from the dam. So we had to stabilize that particular spillway so that it wouldn't erode. And then the other big thing is we brought a lot of pumps in to be able to, and they are now pumping, so that if there is a storm in the next several months, how do we pump that water out uh, be, so that it, we don't continue to have that? That whole uh, structure is going to have to be rebuilt. Uh, that's something that Congress is going to have to decide uh, how, what is the, the capability to be able to do that, but that is a significant uh, challenge on the, on the spillway. So I think the thing you're probably most uh, interested in is uh, electricity. Uh, we've had electrical challenges in um, Texas and in Florida, but they were quickly taken care of by the governors of those two states and a lot, a lot of capability that came into those particular states. Uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands is a completely different paradigm. People have asked me in the last several weeks, you know, why don't you do in Puerto Rico what you could have done in Florida? Because it is an island and it is very, very hard to just drive hundreds of pole trucks and hundreds of material down into Virgin Islands and down into Puerto Rico. 
So our strategy here is fourfold, and I'm going to talk about four lines of effort, and then we can get into details on any one of those. The first thing is temporary generators. We are putting right now um, uh, probably about four to 500 temporary generators in Puerto Rico. Normally, we do 40 to 50. Then they're in there about a week or two, and then we come back in and we take them back out because the grid is back up. This is going to be a massive long-term rebuild of rebuilding the grid in Puerto Rico. So what we are doing is to go all out and put as many generators in we can, maybe in, in public facilities. The key places is that we got a list from the governor. All the mayors donated to that list. And the list has got about 428 different requirements on it today. I think I got about 10 more today that come in. And so we know exactly what the priorities of the governors are of where should we have electricity. Hospitals are on the top of the list. Then you have water facilities, uh, wastewater facilities. Uh, what about things like cell phone? phone tower areas? How do we continue to take care of, uh, uh, you know, government facilities? Schools were a big thing to be able to get the schools up and running. So how do you continue to put those generators in? These are not a general like you would buy at a great big, uh, uh, you know, convenience store downtown. This is a generator that's pulled behind an 18-wheeler. Some of these are 30 and 40 feet long. Major generation capability to go back in. As of today, we've got 148 of those installed. Uh, we've got about another 280 on hand, and we've got about another 130 30 coming in. This is where there is no lack of generators. And when I need help, extra help and we need extra help, uh, de the Defense Logistics Agency and FEMA have come forward to be able to continue to fly in, barge in generators to be able to help make that happen. We have a 911 generator crew. I have a battalion. This is the 249th Engineer Battalion. Uh, we have it in the Army. And that battalion basically has got a team so that 3 o'clock in the morning, about a weekend ago, we had a, a clinic on uh, one of the islands in Vieques that uh, went down. A generator went went down on there. We put two generators on the barge. Our soldiers took that generator over, installed it, and got that back up and running by the end of the day because they had that level of agility to be able to get that generator back in. So how long are those generators going to be there? They're going to be there until the grid gets back up. The goal is to get 100 percent of power back to everybody on Puerto Rico. It's just that some of these generators could be there for months and months on end. There's another area, and we're trying to look out where are there problems in the system. There are places in Puerto Rico where there were hospitals that had a generator. It's just it's an old generator. So it was actually running. Now what we've done is we've come in to, with a contractor to service those generators to be able to make sure they're getting the oil change, they're getting the fuel they need. And if, in fact, we find an older generator that we don't think is going to be able to carry the load, we'll take that generator back out and we'll put a FEMA generator in to be able to make sure that we can continue to have reliable power to those critical facilities. We can't do houses. We're mainly looking at big, big, large facilities to keep them going. So that's really the the temporary generator, and that's kind of this um, line of effort one on this four different prong approach. Line of effort two is really generation, and this is where we really have our, uh, our work cut out for us in the long term. Generation is power plants. We need about 2,500 megawatts of power throughout Puerto Rico to be able to restore the power back up to where it was at the beginning of the storm. Uh, today, right now, <clears throat> we've got about 21.6 percent of that up. Uh, the dual technical number is about 579 megawatts that's online, and we continue to put two or three more percent back up and running. But the challenge we have, and I'll refer to the chart over here a little bit, most of the electricity, I'll slide this over a little bit closer here, most of the big power plants are down in the south. And this is where they were built, and so there's an awful lot of generation capability down in the south. Most of the load is up in the north. And to be specific, there are seven large power plants that normally run off of fossil fuel. There's about seven power plants that run off of solar or wind. And then there's 21 power plants that actually are hydro, big dams that make electricity with water. But the majority of that power is down on this south sector. And again, the load is up in San Juan. So the challenge is, how do you continue to get that electricity from south to north? Even if, in fact, all of the power plants are up and running, we would have a generation shortfall. So about a week and a half ago, we, uh, we cut a contract to a large company to come back in and place a temporary power plant in San Juan. That arrived a week ago. It came off a gigantic barge, and that power plant is being built today and will be up by the end of October. That'll put another 50 megawatts into the grid in what I will call this island of San Juan. It's an island of power 
because that's where these power plants are, and they're basically around the perimeter of the island. The other problem we have is what's the reliability of the generation that's out there? All we're going to do is to be able to get that generation up to 100%. But the question is, is that good enough, and how long will that stay? So this is a report, 271 pages long. It was done by an independent firm uh, back in 2016, and it talks about the how frail this network is, how frail these generators are, the average age of the those seven fossil fuel power plants is 44 years old. So this is a very, very old system. There's actually one of the power plants up here in San Juan that was actually shut down seven weeks before the storm because it had massive maintenance challenges. So even when we bring this back up, all we're going to do is to be able to uh, get it up to that given level to have 100% of power. And this is where um, the, the, the bigger question is, what's the long-term plan for Puerto Rico? And I'm going to talk about that when I talk about the end of the so we talked about temporary power. We talked about generation. Now I want to talk about transmission. The number one goal right now of what the core is doing is to be able to move this electricity that's in the south up to the north. So this is really a grid of transmission lines. Transmission lines are very, very tall towers, about 75 feet high, and they go all throughout the uh, they go all throughout Puerto Rico. The blue ones are actually what's called the 230 kV. The red ones are a little bit smaller, but again, very, very large power lines. Most of the transmission is uh, is in <clears throat> not bad shape, but there's an awful lot of requirements to continue to be able to get some of these lines up and running. We probably need three lines from the south to the north across the mountain to be able to continue to put enough electricity up in San Juan. Today we have one, so right now the crews are out working the second and third line to be able to continue to move that up. Once we connect south to north, it really is kind of like a network. It's like a table with four legs. It's much, much more sturdy because you're able to backfeed those power plants from different sizes. So that's really what the big focus is to get the transmission up and running. We probably need about 338 towers. These are these 75-foot towers. So the team's building this and to be able to continue to fly them back in. And then we need uh, uh, an awful lot of connectors and cable as well. But the whole goal is to get the transmission up and running. And I want to stress up here right up front is that we're partners side by side with not only the governor's office, but the Puerto Rico Power Authority, PREPA. And we've got to be able to continue to understand it's their system. We're working side by side to understand what the priorities are. But PREPA is doing an awful lot of work. Uh, we've got some of our soldiers in there from one of our battalions in. And then we've got a lot of contractors coming in. The Corps of Engineers just awarded a very, very large contract with $240 million with a capacity to go over a billion dollars to the floor company. They're in mobilizing right now of bringing pole trucks in, people, a lot of capability in to be able to get to a total of 435 crews is what we're shooting for between PREPA and our contractors. We also just awarded another large contract from the state of Florida to be able to continue to work to be able to get this transmission up and running. So, that's the third big line of effort. But even once we get the transmission running throughout all of Puerto Rico, the problem is going to be how do you get that down to the people? And that's what we call distribution. So this is when you have houses with power poles, the poles and the lines, to be able to continue to connect those. And, I, and this is where the real challenge is. We need 62,000 poles to be able to get this up and running. And we haven't done a 100% assessment of all this, but based on what we assess right now with several different flights over this, this network and talking to our, our uh, teammates in PREPA, uh, that was 62,000 poles. We're probably going to need about 6,500 miles of wire. Just imagine 6,500 miles of electrical wire. You say, why can't this be done faster? The average trained crew on a flat football field can probably put two poles in a day. You don't have a flat football field. You've got a road with down the trees in it, and when you go up to where to replace that line, all these telephone poles are lean, I mean, all these power poles are leaning over all the old cables still on it so you've got to strip all that back out and completely rebuild that grid so it's going to take a lot of time for 435 crews to be able to get all of those poles up and running to get them in ground um, the, this is a massive logistics uh, challenge and so we're bringing in about 150 million dollars right now of cable and poles this has come in with a lot a lot of support from the FEMA team and DLA Defense Logistics Agency and we've got uh, uh, basically large large, large logistics bases. We'll put one in the east, the north, the south, and the west to be able to receive those. And the challenge is going to be, 
how do you get them, get them up in the top of some of those mountains to be able to take care about that? You're going to ask, what about time? So this is the challenge. Uh, w- there's some of these lines that we know relatively well. Can we, we can drive and see them. The crews have assessed them, and we know where we're at. Uh, the governor has uh, made a, uh, a milestone of trying to get 30 percent of the Puerto Rican uh, load up by the end of October, and then 50 percent by the end of November. I personally think those are stretch goals, but we're very, very committed to trying to meet where the governor's at, and all of our guys are going all out with every single thing we can to meet the governor's goals. The challenge is going to be, how do you get past 50 percent? And I personally think that it's going to go into January and February to get the majority of the back up and running. The challenge is going to be, there's what I call the last mile. Up on one of these mountains, I flew over it last week, there's a couple houses up there that are fed by one line that comes up the side of a cliff, and then it goes down about two or three miles, and there's two houses on the end. It's going to take a long time to get those. I've been saying for a couple of weeks it could take almost up to a year. I'd like to think we could get that done by the end of May, but there are going to be some people on Puerto Rico in very, very remote locations that are going to need power for a long, long time. And so this is where it goes back to this whole idea about passion and urgency. Every single thing we can possibly do, the federal government, FEMA, the Department of Defense is doing to step up, and we're trying to continue to shorten those timelines. I certainly hope that I'm wrong and that we can go an awful lot faster. But what I don't think it is smart to do is to give false hope to those people that are in very, very remote, austere locations that the power is going to be on next week, because in some of these, it's going to be a hard build. The, the last thing I'll end with is the most significantly damaged area is really this east end. Uh, the distribution out here is almost 100 percent down. So that's where, while we have other areas that we can come up and run, and we're seeing power on now down in the southwest area. I talked about San Juan. That's up and running. But how do we continue? continue to be able to push that power all the way down to the last house. And I'll just end with this fact that it is. It's where our 2,000 people on the ground, uh, Jeff Buchanan's, uh, his thousands of people that are down there every single day. How do we work uh, as a federal family to continue to be able to reach out, understand the requirement, think out of the box, be innovative, and no rest until everybody in Puerto Rico gets 100 percent power? So with that, I'll pause and we can go into details on anything you want to. Uh, thank you, sir. We'll open the floor for questions. Hi, I'm Phil Stewart from Reuters. Uh, you said you just came out of a cabinet meeting. Um, could you talk about what resources you were asking for, what uh, commitments you got? And then also, uh, 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 Senator Rubio yesterday was uh, quite critical of, of the core and, uh, and the lack of contracts being uh, uh, distributed. Could you speak a bit about where you are with contracting? Yeah, sure. So um, the contracts have been awarded. We awarded the big one on Monday. I'm not sure Senator Rubio knew that at the time. And that was the one, this, uh, the floor contract. Uh, again, the total on that, the cap is about 1.3, but I'm not limited to that. We can go higher if we need to, okay? And then the power secure one we awarded on Wednesday. So we basically have got enough capacity inbound to be able to take care of that. The cabinet meeting was really focused on me giving them an update, and it was almost the same exact update I gave you. My mission is to get the res- Response. So how do we continue to respond in accordance with the Stafford Act to basically put back the grid as it was pre-storm? Here's the, cha- here's the thing that's different, though. Um, there's a lot of the grid that wasn't built to code. A lot of the b- grid was damaged. So you talk about this report here. Some of these lines didn't have enough poles. They had too much span between the cables. Some of the poles were cracked by other storms. Some of the channels right there. There's even some su- substations that we think were in flooded areas. When we go back in, we're we're going to do this as the Corps of Engineers would do. We're going to do it to standard. We're going to do it to code, and we're going to continue to bring it up so that it's the uh, a, a system that would be uh, very, very similar to before the storm. I think the big thing that the cabinet is working on right now, and I'm not going to, um, I don't have a lot of insight as to where uh, the cabinet's going to go with Congress on this, but what is the long-term plan? And that's where the, I talk about passion. A lot of people in that room today continue to be able to try to talk about where is America going to go and how are they going to figure out how to take take care of the people of Puerto Rico. And I'm going to leave that up to the cabinet and the White House. And when they tell me what to do, then I will certainly go back in and change that specification. And just, to, just to follow up on that, I mean, you seem to suggest in your briefing and kind of hinted at it just now that you think that the, I mean, even though you're working right now to restore the old system, you seem to be suggesting the old system wasn't really that good. 
Um, uh, is there I'm not suggesting, I'm telling you. The old system was terrible. So does it make sense to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars restoring a system that, that was terrible? The biggest problem with the old system was generation, really. It was really the power plants. It was these things that are in purple around here that are years and years old, and they actually need an awful lot of, they have a lot of neglect, and they have a lot of backlog maintenance. The system that we're putting in is mainly transmission and distribution. All of those people living around Puerto Rico, they deserve a line down to their house. So we're putting in that system that they're going to need to have. The question really comes back to the investment that's going to meet on, on generation. And do you go back in a good example? Uh, there's seven fossil fuel, but as I talked about, seven solar and, and wind in 21 hydro. So where does Puerto Rico or the federal government invest? Do you invest in more wind and solar? There's a lot of advantages to wind and solar. Do you invest in more hydro? I think that's some of the question. How do you solve uh, a long-term deficiency in generation uh, maintenance by uh, figuring out how to augment that, that generation capability. And what does the core recommend? Right now, we are not to a point to recommend. I've not been in those other power plants. I've been, all we know is that we have a gap in San Juan. So the core is putting 50 megawatts in right there. We're working very closely with the Department of Energy. They're the real experts when it comes to the grid. And I think they're the ones that we're going to lean on very carefully to figure out what would be the right long-term solution. Thank you. Hi. Hi, sir. Stephanie Ramos with ABC News. So it's been a month now since Hurricane Maria made landfall on Puerto Rico. We, as you mentioned, 20 percent, about 20 percent of the island uh, does have power, and that number has fluctuated. Um, we understand there are challenges on the island to, to get that power restored, but how did the Corps prepare uh, before the storm hit? Was there some sort of strategy already in place uh, when, when we knew Hurricane Maria was going to hit Puerto Rico? So um, of the five missions that I kind of laid out, our primary mission when it comes to electricity is the temporary power. So a lot of times we go in before a storm, we go to the hospitals and we write down how much does the hospital need. We'll go to the police station, we'll go to the fire station. We'll have contracts on the shelf. So this was there all before. So the contracts were already before the storm. We basically were ready to activate that contractor and fly generators in. Uh, the Corps put 127 people into Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands before the storm, rode through the Category 5 storm, or rode through the storm inside a secure building. So we were able to come right back out the next day. So when it came to things like blue roofs, temporary generators, and all the rest, we had that. I think the thing that uh, neither FEMA nor Puerto Rico nor us understood was the severity of the storm and the magnitude of the destruction when it came to the power grid. So this is where we did not have a contract on the shelf to be able to say, rebuild the entire grid. And so it takes a while to do a contract in accordance with all the rules we have. And this is where our contracting guys have been very, very fast and very streamlined. I think the other thing to point out at is that wherever we've had any kind of a challenge, whether it's the FEMA leadership has given us the top cover, the White House to say continue to be able to drive on, we're going to be legal, we're going to be smart, we're going to do things right, but we're going to be very, very aggressive on how fast we can do them. Let me, let me just go back real quick. So in the United States, what happens is there are agreements between all the states. So if Florida has a significant requirement, this is a very complicated thing we can get into, but it's a different uh, agreement between power companies and states, and the, those agreements and these big power authorities would very easily be driving three or four or 500 trucks down to that state before the storm or getting them all ready to go. That's the challenge, is that there were not agreements between those power authorities in Puerto Rico here, so this is where it's a little bit different dynamic uh, than what you would see in the rest of the the 48 continental states. Yes, sir. Yeah, Bill, could you uh, please explain some of the figures on the chart over here, like the uh, 922 million in Puerto Rico? What does that refer to? Is that the total spent thus far? Same thing with. So Virginia. I'll just walk you down real quick. So uh, um, <clears throat> this is again talking about the Corps of Engineers, not talking about the defense, uh, the defense missions here. Um, basically, we have gotten 20. These are uh, Puerto Rico on the left, Virgin Islands on the right. So about a total of 50 missions across the board. Uh, we have been tasked to do 922. Sir, that's not all obligated. This is what people have. This we, is just the core. Just the core. Just the core. Just the core. Do you have a ballpark figure for how much has been spent thus far by everybody? No, I don't. 
No, I, I know right now that uh, we have been asked by FEMA to do somewhere in the $1.2 billion range. Uh, and again, I've got a lot of other people in the other ones, but I think today, again, somewhere around uh, eight or 900 that are out on the ground. This talks about the blue roofs. Uh, we think we might need up around 5,000. We're at uh, 642 today, so that's about 14%. You'll see we're a little bit higher in Puerto Rico, but the number's a little bit lower. When it comes to uh, temporary power, I talked about generators. We think, again, somewhere around 428. That number does change. Um, same that we're doing a little bit better here in the uh, Virgin Islands on getting those generators out. The debris management, it looks like we haven't done much, but that's only because we have 6.2 million cubic yards. That's a mass. I think it's 350 Olympic-sized swimming pools that we're going to need to be able to move and to be able to get that out of people's uh, front yards and off the roads. And then uh, mainly, these are some of the assessments that we've done back in some of the facilities. 40% hospitals, 63% airports, 25% water. Uh, we've done some schools and then emergency response facilities. And then uh, it, this is kind of the grid, which I've already talked through. So, and this is available every day. Uh, I certainly would offer you it if uh, you want to go online and find this. FEMA has the same kind of infographic, so you can pull FEMA's, and I know DOD does as well. General, you said, uh, you said earlier uh, you just let a contract to floor $240 million. Yes, sir. Okay. And um, so that would be on top of the 922. So you're up over a billion. No, right? that's really, well, that, that 240, the initial task force order is 240 of that 922. It's got the capacity to go to 1.3. It's in the 922. Okay, but you said it might go to 1.3. It might. And, and this is where, again, uh, and I'll be very, very honest with you, FEMA has not tied our hands. They said if the mission needs to be done and we need to take care of getting people back into order, then uh, this is the money you're allowed to spend. And I have not been told no on a, what I feel is a valid requirement that we need to spend. And just one, one other, please. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, one other, please. And I don't know if this is in, um, in your lane, but uh, some of the reports um, uh, from the field about the um, about the hospitals, and perhaps that the um, uh, the field hospitals that uh, the U.S. has put in and the Comfort are being underutilized. For instance, 250 beds on the Comfort, and um, there was one report last night that only 29 of the beds were occupied. Can you explain yes, that? Yes, sir, I can't, I can't answer that. I mean, I've got enough worried about electricity, so I mean, I'm sure DOD can give you an answer on that one and, uh, and certainly be able to refer, refer back to uh, the, the, them on that. Uh, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference in, from Vieques to the main island in terms of the, rest, uh, the restoring of electricity? So um, right now, from a temporary power thing, we think we're okay. It's about the same. We've got the generators are out there. Uh, we have not seen quite as much damage out there, and I think uh, that's also fed by an under water line. And so the main question is make sure we've got to test, test the, the validity of that line. Is that up and running? Because it's out here on the... On the west, the question is, I mean, on the east, this is where a lot of that damage was. So we're going to work our way out there, um, and, and it goes back to, uh, it's just the priorities. So I, I can certainly follow up and find out where we're at on that. I have not been to Vieques yet to see exactly where we're at on it, but it's one of the things where it's all these priorities, and there's, as much as there's um, things that are important, uh, everybody deserves the same right to power. So whoever you're living on there, well, you're just as high on the list, and we're going to be just as uh, committed to get out in there and taking care of you. Give me a sense of how much personnel is out in Vieques. Uh, I, I don't know that. Um, I think I've got about a team of about five to ten out there, but it's mainly doing assessments, and then they call forward uh, our guys if they need to to be able to bring them back out from Puerto Rico. When we went out the other day, it was about a, a three-hour uh, ferry to bring generators back and forth, and then if there's a requirement, I'll just keep our people out there on the, uh, on the island. Am I oversimplifying then to, to assume that Vieques could see um, – a slower sort of return to normalcy in terms of electricity, given the focus on the main island? Um, I think we have enough contractors to continue to be able to bring everybody up about the same. We don't want to focus on just one community or another. Uh, you know, how do you somehow be able to make, because, I mean, it really goes back to bringing everybody back at the same place. And so uh, we'll take a look at it. If I think that for some reason we aren't putting enough capability out there, then we'll continue to change and be flexible. And I think that's the point. We want a flexible plan. If the governor comes back in and gives us a different priorities or I get different pri priorities from uh, FEMA tomorrow, we're able to adapt. I don't want to do work twice, but we've got to be able to continue to be flexible here as to how we can step up and be able to respond. We have time for one more question. 
Yes, sir. Um, sir, you, 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 thank you for your candor um, in, in saying how the system was terrible to begin with and that you're restoring it. Um, you say that there's going to be a next level after that. Is the core going to be responsible for that, or is this private enterprise that's going to have to assume the, uh, the next step, or is that a government uh, decision? I think it's too early to tell. Um, the core mainly works its C-O-R-E functions. Uh, we don't normally come in and rebuild an entire grid, so this is something where the Department of Energy, if, if they have that capability to do that through a commercial <laughs> capability, they certainly can. Uh, we're able to be able to respond, though, and if needed, we'll certainly step up. It depends on uh, what FEMA and DOD needs us to do. I'm right, uh, right now, we are all trying to go all out to get to 100% power, and I'll be honest, We've got um, a lot of work to do in the next several months. What happens after that is really going to go back to, you know, uh, what the president and Congress are going to do as a long-term rebuild. And if I, if I may, um, sorry, Steph. Yeah. <laughs> we both work at the same organization, yeah. my apologies. Um, if I could, um, going back to her earlier question about what could have been done before, yeah. as a lesson learned, um, is it possible that in the future you may preposition or leave behind some of these 500 generators, large generators, <clears throat> in place? to facilitate, uh, you know, coming hurricane seasons in over the next decade. So, I mean, we learned an awful lot from Sandy. We learned a lot from Matthew. Uh, we continue to have teams that we built. We, are, we change our doctrine all the time. One of the things that gets to be uh, tough, though, is having an awful lot of equipment, especially equipment that needs maintenance, sitting in great big yards. So the question is, if you don't know where the storm's going to come, I mean, this could very easily have hit anywhere else. Think about how, like Matthew, a lot of times bounced all the way up the side. So every state can't have 500 generators sitting in the yard. I think what we're able to do now is I'm able to, we're able to stay ahead of um, of getting the people in first to put the generators in, and we're able to fly the generators in fast enough. So the generator, I have nobody waiting for generators. I guess that's what I'm saying. The system is agile enough to be able to get generators in fast enough. FEMA does have stockages of them, so they're able to get them in uh, very, very quick. Uh, but I think this is one of the things we're looking at. I've got a senior leader meeting in a couple months where we're going to do a big A after action review to say what could we have learned here? Could we have done blue roofs faster? What else could we have done with water or something else? And I think that's what all of the federal government has to do. You can't be satisfied with where we're at. I'm not satisfied where we're at right now. I'd love to be able to say we could bring these timelines and make them a lot quicker. So how could we figure out, do you prep, is it, do you prep more? Do you have more contracts on the shelf? Uh, do you build more capability out there? Every one of these storms is different. And I think the uniqueness of both the uh, the deterioration of the grid in Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands has got just as many challenges on electricity as Puerto Rico does, as well as the fact that it's a remote site with a massive logistics requirement is what makes this one so hard. Thank you, sir. Um, do you have any final thoughts? I do. So listen, uh, I, I certainly want to invite you to come to Puerto Rico or to Virgin Islands or to Florida and see the Corps of Engineers or I'm sure Department of Defense to be able to come around. Uh, we certainly bring our reporters in and to be able to show you this. There is, it's, it's great to be able to talk about this in Washington, D.C., but until you're on the ground and you're in the back of a Humvee or you're in the back of a vehicle and you see soldiers and airmen and service members out doing the great job, you see our civilians, you see the FEMA employees, it's hard to understand this idea of the passion and the urgency. So I would just encourage you to, to come ride with us, and we'll certainly put you in a vehicle and show you how generators go in. But um, if there's anything that we could do to do this faster, we would we would be doing it. And so this is where it's not because we aren't we don't have the support. It's because this is a massive, massive rebuild that is going to take months, and we're going all out, and I'm getting all the help that I need from the federal government. Hey, thanks an awful lot. Can I ask you to clarify one thing? Yeah, sure. Thing. You mentioned earlier uh, that the generators aren't being distributed to, let's say, individuals on the island that are still in the dark. You're, is, is that right, that folks that are still in the dark right now, living in uh, you know, those challenging areas of the island, they're not getting generators? There's a time where the grid will be up before we're able to distribute generators to 3.4 million houses. Just think about that, okay? So I mean, this is best about how many people are there. So at some point, if we need be, and, and it's longer than that, then we will continue to keep putting generators in. We're never going to turn the temporary generators off. But I don't, I don't see a need to go to every single individual house and putting a generator in there because I think we're, we're hoping that we'll get the grid up and running as fast as we possibly can. Uh, and it's just something that normally, I mean, just the magic.
magnitude of the resonance in the houses out there because then you got to be able to uh, right now we're going to every single generator we're checking it on you know does it have fuel does it have all you know the right filters all the kind of the service requirements so right now the main focus of what fema and the core delivers is generators to some type of a public facility okay we could go to large housing areas if there are some we did this in some of the other storms if you have 20 families in a in a large public housing area we could certainly go to that we're going to keep working our way down the list and the question is we'll just keep going until the grid comes back up and i think you'll find that the grid will be up before we're able to get down to the list where we're doing individual houses okay Thank you. This is the press conference. If you have any questions, we do have the public affairs officer for USA here in the, in the room. His name is Captain Ryan Hignite. He can be reached at 402-326-2782. And again, he's here in the room. So if you have any follow-ups, please uh, reach out to him. Thank you again, sir. Okay, great. Hey, thank you, man. Thanks, sir.